Okay, now for our interview with Gary Voorhees. I started by asking him about when he first saw the Tic Tacs with his own eyes. Yeah, the big eyes on the ship, um, they're pretty heavily, you know, they're, they're massive binoculars. I mean, they, they <laughs> if you uh, if you search Navy big eyes on the, uh, on the internet, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Was there a line of people uh, looking to use those things to check these things out? No, nah, because you kind of you kind of have to be a little slick to get out on a bridge wing. Uh, while we're in transit, like we are uh, when we were doing this, you don't <laughs> you don't really want to be up there as very long because it's actually pretty chilly with the wind, and it it you know you got there's nothing. There's just you, the big eyes, and then nothing in front of you so there's nothing to break the wind as the ship's moving mm. and how many times did you get on the big eyes to check these things out uh over the week i probably went up there uh, probably about maybe 14 or 15 times and was only able to actually see something maybe five times or so mm. and who else went up there as far as you know um, I've heard a couple of the other people have gone up there. Um, like when you go up to the bridge wing, unless you're like an officer or somebody that somebody's not going to question, uh, you tend to kind of just meander out there, see what you can see, and then come back in so that you don't really, uh, so nobody really asks any questions or you don't get in trouble. And about how many people were on the Princeton? Um, I think there's a complement of about, uh, I think 500 or so. Would you say that all 500 were aware of the incident at the time? I wouldn't say all 500 were aware, um, but I could say anybody with a secret clearance was. Does that mean that you weren't supposed to talk about it? No, uh, just uh, their jobs didn't really entail being anywhere. I mean, they might have heard that we were tracking unknowns or maybe you know, a little bit here and there about it, but I uh, wouldn't say that they were like uh, briefed on it or anything like that. They would only know the, you know, wh whatever we said on the smoke deck. And that's kind of what I was referring to. I'm just kind of trying to get a picture of how a buzz the ship was about this. Um, to the more informed, you know, the, the people with the higher clearances that were involved in the combat and standing watches, uh, uh, you know, we were all talking about it. But... Uh oh. You just cut out. Yeah, hold on. Sorry. I okay, you're some, back. Yeah, I had some. Uh, I muted myself. I just had uh, some people come into the house, so okay. I just was <laughs> trying to spare you that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the, yeah, so it's like uh, you know, junior personnel or deck deck personnel, things like that. I mean, unless they were interested in it, they really wouldn't, you know, even care unless like we were about to go to combat action stations or. We were, we're going to go to DQ or something like that. And during about, what was it, about six days that you guys were seeing them? Yeah, over over the entire week. Uh, it was probably, we were probably out for a couple of days before we started seeing them or before I was aware of them. Um, I was mostly made aware it's just because the, the spy technicians had to, uh, you know, one of them was talking to me about it on a smoke break. And then that's when I kind of got interested. And then, he said that we were going to have to recalibrate spy and the standby because I got I run all their computer systems that run the spy radar. So when they do their calibrations, I basically just stand by and wait for them to reset, say to reset the computer systems. Mm -hmm. um, and then not a fabulous job, but it's uh, you know it runs all of them. <laughs> right. So the story is that they were encounter they were seeing these things, weren't sure what they were, and asked you guys to recalibrate the system, thinking that maybe it's a system error. Well, not so much of a system error, but we just had to make sure. I mean, if you're going to come go tell the captain that, uh, you know, we're tracking unknown aircraft, you better be damn sure that it's an actual thing. So it, it was more of a precaution. Uh, clutter generally gets naturally filtered out by the spy system. Um, so, like, say if there was, uh, you know, dense formations in, like, a, a cloud or, you know, if it was something that wasn't, like, particularly a – a solid object, but it was seeming, you know, solid at times because of how dense it was, then it might show up for a split second or two, but then would quickly get filtered out. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the captain, that's Captain Smith. Uh, that would be correct. What, what is his first name? Uh, well, Red, 
Red. Uh, yeah. Well, Captain Captain, we always called him Red. Um, okay. I think it was James Smith. If I want, if I want to, that's a, that's what I want to say. But yeah, he come on board right after we got back from deployment. Um, I didn't know him very well because I left the ship right after that. Um, but I just remember everybody calling him Captain Red. And he was at the, in the highest position on that ship. He was in charge. Yeah. And at the time, I was only E4. So you got to remember, I'm not going to have a whole lot of interaction with the captain. Mm -hmm. And then he would have reported to the head of the whole strike group? Um, usually the embark commander on the carrier. Uh, usually the carrier will have a captain, and then there'll be an embark, an embark commander, which is usually a... Uh, a, a uh, admiral lower half or something of that nature on the carrier he's running the entire strike group and then each captain is control of their own ships and then so the issues the orders would be issued from him down and and up and then of course there's always message tra message traffic that comes from every ship too and that's coming out of our cess which is just a uh it's a it's a beyond top secret room because it's a SCSI top secret, meaning that you have to have a specific type of clearance to be in there. Even if you have top secret, you can't just be in there unless you have clearance to be in there. Mm -hmm. Cause that's actually the same room that, uh, uh, Jason Turner was able to actually see this film it on because, uh, in his position as a sword keeper, he's got access to that room because he delivers their parts and, uh, any, anything that they order, he, he actually has to hand deliver into that room. So during this week, how obsessed were you with these objects? For me, uh, I was a bit obsessed about it, uh, just because I didn't know what they were. And you got to remember, they weren't doing anything crazy or fantastic or, you know, mind bending until, the, the uh, F-18 interrogations happen. So these things are just basically doing like 100 knots, just floating, doing nothing. They're not coming at us. They're not trying to engage us. They're, they're just these benign floating things doing 100 knots due south and then disappearing from time to time. Which means at that point, they could have been some type of drone, right? Um, could have been a drone. It could have been... Uh, um, uh, it could have been a lot of things. Uh, I don't know what they were. Um, I, I mean, like I said before, I know a lot of people want to believe it's aliens or some people want to believe that it's our secret military government you know, projects or anything like that. The only thing I know is that these things were working on levels of physics that we don't understand even, even today. We got a better idea of how they could have worked today through a lot of the, the, the more modern stuff that's happening within the last couple of years with quantum physics. But these things, once they were interrogated by the F-18, they, I mean, they displayed abilities, you know, uh, such advanced technology. And that's what piqued my interest because honestly, prior to that, I didn't give a damn other than it was just something interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of my point is, is that from what you observed until they were intercepted was something that could have had a, relatively benign explanation could have just been drones out there right i mean something traveling at 100 knots yeah it I could know have been it's considered a, slow but well, it's considered slow but i mean it'd be, it'd be fast for a balloon unless it was caught in a trade wind or you know something like that i mean balloons can go pretty fast if they got a good enough wind um it could have been some type of ultra they could have been ultralights they could have been a lot of different things i don't mm. think anybody would be nuts enough to fly an ultralight that far out into the open ocean but you know i mean people fly down the sides of mountains too so yeah so bottom line at that stage i mean still today of course they're uaps but at that stage in your mind they're they're uaps um is that the first time that you had ever encountered uaps that's pretty much the first weird thing that ever happened in the entire time I was in the service. Mm -hmm. And nothing since then? No, nothing since then. But uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm guilty of being one of these people that don't look up very often. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, then they, they send them out for the intercept, and that's where they display this uh, incredible supersonic speed, etc. cetera. Um, were you listening in um when fravor was going out there to inspect these things 
Uh, no, I, I actually got got word that they were doing an interrogation from another technician, and we actually, you know, he's like, "Yeah, we're we're watching it up in Spy." So we went up to this the Spy and watched it, um, and we were watching. We were watching. I I was under the impression that it was live, but apparently it may not have been. So, but nobody specifically told me it was live. So I think it was just an impression that I had at the time because of the way people were talking. You know, they're like, Oh, they're doing the, F they're doing the interrogation. And the first time I heard that they might do an interrogation was actually the day before. So I was like standing by waiting to hear it. And I kept poking my head into combat and nothing happened. So I kind of gave up on it. And then the next day I'm up smoking and you know, guys like, Hey, we're, you know, we're watching the intercept up in the, up in, on the 04, which is where the spy, the spy deck, you know, offices. I'm like, all right, you know, so we hauled ass up there and, you know, they were watching it and I caught the film and, you know, I was like, at that point it blew my mind because, you know, you see the insert you guys saw, except without all the grainy compressed garbage. And then you would see it actually, uh, him pull the, pull the, pull it out farther so that it was uh, more of a field of vision of what it was doing because it started actually moving in right angles and moving out of the frame. And, but, you know, you would think uh, at first I thought it would be like, uh, you know, where he was pulling the, the camera off and it was just making it look like it's moving off the frame. But then as he pulled the camera and uh, zoomed or you know, pulled the zoom in so that it was wider field of vision, you could actually see this thing take right turns without stopping. You know, they were, it would just the same acceleration. It wasn't slowing down, turning, taking a right turn and going. It was just constant speed, right turn, bug out, come back, you know, uh, a right, a right angle, turn left, right angle, turn right, move around, um, figure eight, not like figure eights, but I mean, tight circles. I mean, just anything, it, it just could, do anything in any direction any it could move at uh you know impossible ways um and whose video was that that you were seeing is that underwoods um I, as far as i know it would have been underwoods uh i didn't even know who the pilot was until this all came out uh -huh. yeah, until 2017 because prior to hearing the rest of the story from like other perspectives and hearing the pilots, uh, hell, I didn't even know who they, who they were, what their names were. We saw that video and it's just been, you know, every time, a clo you know, close a couple of buddies who having a couple of beers, you know, Hey, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> yeah. I go, and it's a, it's a hundred percent true, you know, and they're like, Whoa, no way. <laughs> so, so you, describe the video that you saw versus the one that the rest of us have seen. Cause you're calling, the one we're seeing grainy and compressed, right? Yeah. Uh, first um, of all, why, why do you think we only have the grainy and compressed one? Uh, Cause that's the only one that I've seen as a civilian. Um, but, but, but how would it uh, be that the video went from being high grade to low grade? Um, usually if it was uh, compressed on purpose for the purposes of sending us an email, like if I had to send it off ship, uh, we were using SHF at the time, so it would have had to have been sent over SHF and sent as an email. And back then, everything had to be, I think, under four megabytes, if that. Mm -hmm. So you would have had to compress the crap out of that, which would have degraded the uh, quality of the film. So you don't think it was something that's done intentionally by the military so that the public is seeing less? I think that this is the portion of the film that actually got out to the public. And, you know, if they do have the same film, it would be probably a lot better quality version of it. Um, I think that may, that may be this, the, the only length that they still have because it is the meat and potatoes of the, the whole thing. You see the, you see most of what's going on in the film. And if they just cut out everything that wasn't, you know, cause you gotta remember there was a lot of, flying around a lot of it not in the frame a lot of just kind of garbage video that really didn't show you anything it wasn't until that the segment you saw and then maybe another three minutes worth after that that would have been worth even seeing and then and the rest of it was just the jet flying around mm. what was it still black and white what you saw uh yeah but it was clearer um it was it was still you know Fleer and then the gun you know him flipping through each one trying to find you could like 
if you, if you like if you were sitting in a cockpit and you were you're seeing exactly what he was seeing you could you could imagine exactly what he was trying to do by the way that he was using the camera you know when he, at first he was trying to get it in the frame and then he was flipping through the different now when he flips through the different uh, cameras what he's trying to do is he's trying to look for heat signatures he's trying to look for maybe an engine compartment he's looking for you know using all these different cameras to find out more information about the object it's a it, it would be a tactic that he would be using with that camera not just flipping through to see the best view mm -hmm. um and then, you weren't ever able to see any type of appendage to the tic tac were you in the video that you saw the videos uh, at a certain point when he zooms in on it, you can actually see that there is something on the bottom. I'll be honest, I wasn't paying attention enough. And I know that they were there, but I couldn't tell you the exact shape. They might have been, uh, you know, thicker kind of, you know, where you see the uh, uh, the renditions that you see in the Nimitz encounter, how they're kind of thin. Uh -huh. you know, kind of like feel an like antenna? Yeah, but I think they're a lot thicker than that. And it'd be, like I said, it's a, I'm, basic, I'm basically trying to use 15-year-old memory on it. I remember there being something protruding from the bottom, but mm -hmm. that it was like... Uh... That, that could be used for landing or some type of antenna, right? Yeah, that's correct. It could have, could have been an antenna. It could have been anything. Uh, it could have been something used to just hang itself in a mothership for all I know. <laughs> right. What about uh, barrel rolls? Kevin mentioned that it that it, it was doing barrel rolls. Well, it could it could move in any way. I mean, it, it, when he says barrel roll, you got to remember it just it, it, there's no positional access. Like when you're watching an F-18, you can tell you know what's up and what's down. The only way you can tell the difference in anything on this thing is just by those appendages on the bottom. And yeah, it would it would it would do barrel rolls. It would do, uh, you know, it would shoot off. It would come back. It would. <laughs> I'm sorry, but my little girl just woke up and she's been a little sick. No problem. So yeah, um, you know, Kevin described described them as almost seeming like intelligent life. He, he compared them to birds, maybe scattering, you know, because our... Yeah, and I, and I could see how he could say that because they definitely kind of reacted to the way the pilots move. So, like, if the pilot would move four degrees to the left, it would be, you know, it, it would move an equal distance, you know, so that they would never, ever gain anything on any of these ships. So they would just move, they would just move over and then come back and then it would be able to move around the bottom and then if you listen to Fravor's interview you know he you know he describes how fluidly these things move you know they weren't it wasn't it didn't seem like they were affected by any type of drag or any type of gravitational force which was which it kind of blew my mind because up until I heard Fravor talk about it I only kind of hypothesized it based off the video I saw mm -hmm. Let's talk about the radar system that was on board that you're presumably expert in. And one thing that Kevin reported was that it had just received some type of significant upgrade. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, it got upgraded to the 6.1 baselines for Aegis, which is, uh, included uh, a fiber system and caught off the shelf uh, computer systems that augmented the rest of the system, which basically gave it more processing power. Um, the system itself was already the best in the world and probably the most powerful radar on the planet. Um, I mean, the amount, the amount of tracks that this thing can track and the speed that this thing can track things at, I mean, it, one of the system parameters was that it could, you know, was supposed to be able to track objects going mock speed at almost near re real time. Uh, was when you're looking at a regular radar dish or uses a parabolic dish and it has to rotate, you know, you have a small amount of small amount of time that you have to wait for that thing to rotate. No matter how fast it is, it can't be faster than Spy. Mm -hmm. um, Spy has basically four sets of panels with hundreds of feed horns, and these feed horns all can act independently of each other and track independent targets. So let me ask you, would these Tic Tacs th that you guys first discovered in groups of 8 to 10, would those have been picked up by just 
a standard radar? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I didn't hear if, if the 49 was able to pick them up, which is a navigational radar that we have. And I didn't hear if uh, I haven't gotten a straight answer on whether or not the jets could actually pick them up on their radars or not. Um, but presumably, if they are, in fact, approximately 45 foot long, tic tac shaped physical objects, that should get picked up on regular radar, right? Presumably, as long as it doesn't have some type of issue with it, or maybe they might not be powerful enough, because you got to remember, a spy does put out, you know, a ridiculous amount of power. I'm um, not understanding your point there. Okay, so if, uh, say, if I'm looking at something that's actively uh, dodging, you know, say, like, say I have a, the 49 and a stealth bomber goes by, it's going to look like a barely a blip on the screen where I'm going to get a, a solid track. It's just not going to look right. It's going to, it's going to be, it's not going to, it's not going to come up as a plane and then be dismissed mm -hmm. on, on the uh, spy. Or if uh, the 49 sees a dense particle, you know, a, a dense mass inside of a cloud, like say it's uh, like ice crystals that form in high atmosphere clouds. Um, it's going to see that as a solid object where the, uh, the spy radar would, would would not, and it we could just punch right through that and start and look what's behind it. Mm -hmm. Are there? I presume stealth technologies are designed to so that standard radar does not pick them up. Is that the whole point? Yeah, because they deflect the radar in many different directions or absorb them. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the current te stealth technology either it uses some type of technology to absorb the RF to make its radar cross section little to none, um, then being able to be misdiagnosed as like, uh, you know, either not seen at all or just misdiagnosed as something different than what it is. And can they, does the stealth technology also dupe phased array radar? Like was what was on the Princeton? To be dead honest, I have no idea. Hmm. I never came a track to, uh, we, Never. While I was on board, we've never tracked anything stealth that I that I know of. So, is there anything about this upgrade that was done that would have made it more likely to see these things compared to before the upgrade? Well, with the upgrades, it definitely had uh, more capability, more processing power. Um, you know, it's like the processing power of the computer systems prior to the upgrade was probably the equivalent of of like a scientific calculator you know one of the old uh you know ones you used when you were taking calc <laughs> um but once we did the upgrade you know it went to a caught off the shelf pc system where it had a, a much 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 broader spectrum of its abilities and and basically it's kind of like you know giving it superpowers really it just kind of just beefs the entire system up makes it more capable makes it more you know able to process these things a lot faster so that it can actually determine what it's looking at a lot easier hmm. so what do you think about a theory that these things had been out there before but they weren't detected until the upgrade that's that's one possibility i think that um We've been detecting them, but they've been dismissed. You know, I, I have a feeling that a lot of times we've been picking these things up with ships, even when since ever since radar was created. But due to the stigma, you know, no captain wants to be the guy that tracked UFOs. Mm -hmm. But you had never encountered anything like it before in over how many years? Um, I was on board the ship for about four years. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we, we had never tracked anything like that. But if we had tracked it, if it was just came on the scope and then went off the scope and then never came back, uh, you know, we would have just dismissed it as nothing like clutter and gone. Mm -hmm. um, just the fact that these things stayed for so long is probably the only reason that we really even noticed that they were there. Okay. So uh, during the break, Michael and I were kind of talking about the, um, the video and it's the quality of the video versus what you saw. Um, what you saw theoretically is still in the possession of the Navy right now. Uh, theoretically, yes. Um, they've they've said that they don't have one long, but they never said that it was of lesser quality or the same quality or anything like that. But I I kind of have a hard time believing that personally. Um, I got a feeling that they've got 
the entire flight um, still on film, but um, you, you don't know if, you know, like, like you guys were just discussing, I happen to hear a little bit of it and, you know, I think he's dead right. I mean, if it was our tech, you know, there could have been identifiers on it. It could have been, you know, because you got to remember in the original film, you also see all of the navigational data and the FLIR data that's around the edges. So you're seeing the bearing, the speed, you know, you can tell what you're looking at a lot better and you can tell a lot more environmental information and, you know, what it's doing. And it's also got the little ridges and the edges that show the markers of how fast it's moving so that they can calculate that. That's Where, only in the original um, video, you're saying, the one that you saw. That would be only in the, yeah, that would only be in the original, the actual original tape taken off the jet. And, and am I correct that the video that we're seeing, that was never officially Navy released video. This was leaked video. Yeah. From from what I'm gathering from, you know, think people like Kevin and stuff that say they saw that same video, you know, the next day in their email. I'm t I'm basically taking one plus one equals two. If somebody decided to take that video or at least a good snippet of the, the, the meat and potatoes, compress it and say, hey, guys, check this out, you know, sending it out. You know, say, all right, this is what we saw. Check it out. You know, for those that weren't, you know, privy to actually see the whole video on the on the, on the actual secret land. Mm -hmm. I assume you've read this news about the, the FOIA request response by the Navy. Yeah, and, and I can understand. Um, uh, there's a couple of reasons why I would think that they would say that it would be, you know, of grave danger to release any of it. it one of it could be, A, it can prove that we're not the dominant people in our skies or it could prove that we have a technology that well makes us the most dominant force on the entire planet i mean either way you wouldn't want anybody to know well yeah but you, the navy did confirm that the video that we see is real and that these pilots did in fact encounter a uap which I find that interesting that the Navy was willing to confirm that. What, what are your thoughts? I kind of, if, if it is our technology, I kind of make that, make the assumption that it's kind of like if you, uh, you know, you run into somebody that looks rough and uh, you don't really want to mess with them, but then, you know, he shows you he has a gun. You definitely don't want to mess with him. You don't know if the gun's real. You don't know if it's loaded. You don't know anything about it, but, you know that it's a possibility that he has something that could just completely end your life. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that could be, I'm just, I'm speculating based off the fact that it could possibly be our technology. Um, if it's not our technology, they may just not have a clue on how to deal with it. And you might have one guy that says, Hey, you know, we should just be open about this. And then you have another guy that's like, you know, all of a sudden, next chain comes down the chain of command saying, no, 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 that's not what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. And that does happen a lot in the military. Because mm -hmm. all it takes is the next higher guy to say, eh, no, no, that was wrong. Now, now, you, now you're, uh, you're now one less rank and having to do the same grunt job. So Kevin took note about the fact that the captain seemed somewhat disinterested in what was observed and this is didn't even uh, prepare a report on it. No, he, he, he kind of felt like even today, like if you went and asked him about it today, he would say, I don't recall that incident happening and I don't know anything about anything that happened anywhere remotely or what you're talking about. He wants nothing to do with this whole situation. Has he made any public statements? Um, I don't think, I don't believe that he's made any public statements. I know that when, um, he was talked to he just basically said i don't have no idea what you're talking about and that's all the response that he's given to any of us who was it that he was speaking to i believe kevin's the one that reached out to him mm. um sorry michael sending me a note has who been promoted the captain, captain. What, what what is the, is the captain still in the military I think he's retired now. I think he's actually a uh, diplomat. A diplomat. And was he ever promoted in rank after this incident? I don't. I don't have no idea. Um, 
and then the admiral also didn't do a report about it, and apparently Fravor has spoken out about that and and thought that you know bottom line a report should have been issued. Bottom line, this whole thing should have been taken taken very serious. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you mean we had some type of flying object that could nice. perf- outperform the, the most advanced flying machine on the planet at the time. You know, the F-18 Super Hornet, there was nothing that could really outfly those. There's things that were maybe we could argue were more maneuverable than those jets, but there's just there was nothing as cutting edge as those jets. Mm. Well, a, a good theory could be that the captain and the admiral were in on this. They were privy to exactly what it was, and hence the reason why they were nonplussed about it and were not making a big deal about it. Yeah, they, that could be. I mean, it would be a perfect time to try to do proof of concept of, like, say, they refined a certain system on these ships, and they needed to figure out whether or not the, you know, the current spy radar could see them, or they were just straight testing the ship itself out versus what we what we know to be the most our most advanced, our latest and greatest. You know, um, that very well could be. They might have been just told to not worry about it. So P, PJ Hughes says that that two Air Force personnel came and took his bricks from him off the Nimitz. You're aware of that, right? Yes. So that connects the Air Force to this event. What, what do you make of that? Well, the Air Force has a traditional history of you know taking yeah taking control when it comes to domestic air flights and airspace in the United States. So I mean, when it comes down to it, UAPs would be their domain just naturally. I mean, granted, the Navy has more airplanes and is more well equipped and more everything than the Air Force does, but that's just a point of pride. <laughs> but that would be the Air Force moving incredibly quickly because I think he said the bricks were taken from them the same day. Well, it really wouldn't be because I mean, you got to remember, we were tracking these things for over a week. I mean, it is not improbable that they received message traffic that we were tracking unknowns. Um, you mean, we just assume that the captain and the admirals were doing nothing. They may not have made any official reports, but they could have reported this. You know, I mean, you got to remember the the amount of unknowns in this thing could, you know, f- fill the Grand Canyon. I, w- <laughs> I wish I had way more information, just like the rest of you. Mm. But I mean, in my mind, uh, you know, the higher ups had to have been talking to somebody. Mm-hmm. I mean, our captain seemed very nonchalant about it and seemed almost happy that he didn't have to deal with it. So, mm-hmm. but to send send, I, I don't know. I, I, that that tends to demonstrate taking it very seriously if they're flying in a helicopter out to the Nimitz within hours. The type of people that would be investigating something like this, you know, a captain of a ship would be like, uh, you know, them versus the people investigating it would be just like the captain versus me. I mean, where I'm very insignificant. And if I'm told to shut my mouth at the time, yeah, all right. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it. You know, if they, if they had made me sign a, you know, an NDA, we wouldn't be talking right now. You know, I mean, that's just... And, and according to PJ, there were a number of NDAs that were signed. Yeah. And I, I think that that was kind of a situation I found to be a little odd. And I, there's, it's either... The only thing I can think of is either they recorded information and saw something that we all didn't, that, that at that point they considered they needed to have that NDA signed, or their chain of command, their direct chain of command, jumped the gun. Because um, you know, because the flight, the flight crews have their own commanders. Like as you found out, you know, Commander Fravor was his own commander of his flight group, Black Aces. You know, well, they would have their own commander too. I mean, then these guys, you know, they may not want any of anybody, any of these guys talking about what they saw. You know, they said, you know, keep it, keep it under wraps because we don't want to hear another word about it. You know, and then they jump the gun, make these guys sign NDAs. Now they can't talk to anybody, even other service members, at least why not would, on the record. Why would you refer to that as jumping the gun? Because um, what I'm saying is uh, I use that term by, by saying that if he was, uh, you know, if they just did it without the chain of command telling them to do it. You know, so like the, the commander of that stri- of that group, of that air deck, 
just you know, decides, all right, have these guys sign NDAs without the actual captain saying it. I see. Because if it had been the captain or the admiral, presumably a lot more people would have signed NDAs. Yeah, because then it would have went down to anybody that had access to this information. Like on our ship, everybody on our ship would have had to sign an NDA. You know, everybody on the Nimitz would have had to sign an NDA. So maybe they just either jumped the gun on it or those particular people saw something the rest of us didn't. And I would love to know exactly what they saw. So like PJ, you had your own encounter with gentlemen that came on board the ship in order to take bricks, correct? Well, I don't have bricks. So mine are optical disc drives. Um, yeah, it, it, we do all the recording for the Aegis system. And uh, part of our upgrade was to optical disc drives. Uh, so we had a couple of, you know, there there were three, three, three gig discs, and I had a lot of them full <laughs> from the entire week. Okay, so kind of walk us through all. that. Walk us through that story where you're working um, in the uh, smash and crash team, which I heard you describe in an interview, which is basically, um, God yeah, forbid, there's a helicopter crash. You guys are there to tend to it. Yeah, those and, guys. And, those. Yeah, those yeah. guys all respond to any type of if the if like the helicopter crashes into the deck, like say the t ship takes a roll, just as he's trying to land, it's a very good possibility that one of those blades might hit the deck, and then you got a big problem. So the crash and smash teams to respond to any type of uh, crashes, literally on the deck. Mm -hmm. um, so as the, as they're sitting up there waiting for this helicopter to come down, um, we're watching people get. You know, you just sit there and you watch people get up out of the helicopter and. Then, uh, you know, a couple of guys, civilian clothes, uh, nothing, no men in black or nothing out of the ordinary. You and know, hold on, remind me exactly when was this in the uh, time frame of everything? Probably the same day I saw the video. So it would have been later in the day, early evening. Of, of um, the day Fravor encountered them and then Underwood yes. encountered them. Okay, so later in that day, uh, UCL helicopter land. And a couple plainclothes guys get out, and a cup with a couple military guys. Uh, no military guys, just those two guys popped off, um, and then the helicopter flew away. Uh, the helicopter didn't stay for, and then uh, and and I, uh, I, I, I know it was a long space. It was a long time ago, but describe what they were wearing to the best of your recollection. Um, Polo shirts and khakis. Uh, they, they they were just dressed normal, like normal business casual. Uh huh. Okay, and then you end up seeing them again, right? Yeah, they're down in, uh, in Combat Central, which is just the uh, the space uh, where all of the combat systems are directed from, and uh, it's it's uh, different from. Uh, Con the actual combat center, which is where all of those big consoles and stuff are. So I, I got called uh, down there and they said, do we need all your tapes? And any tapes you didn't record on, you have to erase. And then they made it very clear that even the ones that are still in foil and plastic. So turned over everything I had recorded and then went, went to the task of erasing tapes, which takes forever. Was there any doubt in your mind at that time that they were asking for these because of these Tic Tacs you guys had, had encountered? Uh, no doubt at all. But then again, it's not too unusual for that to happen during any event. We had an event during the last deployment that uh, we had a yeah, I see, we set, had some type of aircraft that went down into the ocean. And, of course, Spike recorded it going down and all that. Um, right after that event, we had to relinquish those tapes, too. And who did um, you give those tapes to? I have my chain of command. Um, this this time, you know, I actually saw the people that were taking the tapes, which is a little different. Usually, it would just be my chief that would come down, take them from me, and then take give them to whoever. Mm -hmm. you know, this time, this time, we, well, I didn't have a chief at the time. You know, he wasn't. We didn't. We our chief at uh, right after deployment left, so they were waiting to fill that billet, and so it was basically just me and two guys that came on after the deployment they were both q70 guys and uh sorry q70 is the uh what they're calling the 6-1 baseline it's the, the newer cut off the self systems are all called q70 um and then uh 
the uh, the acting chief at the time was down there. He handed the tapes right to those guys. They went, and then we went back to flight quarters, and they were gone. Mm-hmm. So who do you think those two guys were? We're, we're, we're based on all your experience in the military and dealing with this kind of stuff. Those guys most likely were from where? Um, if I had to ge- guess, probably Point Ranini. <laughs> Um, cause that's where a lot of the, uh, CEC systems, uh, were developed. A lot of our Aegis stuff, uh, you know, when we go to, you know, some, uh, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that they develop over in, in, on that base. And why wouldn't they be in uniform? Um, they could have been civilian contractors. Um, they could have been out of uniform. Uh, I, I don't really know who they were, so I couldn't really venture to guess exactly who who they were with. If they were wearing a uniform or some type of insignia or were identified in any way, but I was just told not to worry about it. <laughs> Civilian contractors would seem kind of an odd uh, entity to give it to, no? Not really, because um, you got to remember, civilians developed all these systems. All, all these systems are developed by companies that use civilian contractors. Like whenever we get back into port, they do a data dump on all of those systems to check performance, to see how well they did, to see if there was any problems with them, you know, it's, especially if there was any critical errors, which luckily for us on this trip, there really were none. Everything was working perfect. So is that where the video would have resided on those disks that you handed over? No, mine would be raw statistical data from the, from the uh, radars. You would have needed a, uh, uh, a special program to be able to even see the data like you had, would have had to have an interface to see it mm. so you know, so it was just data no for instance video of what the radar system would have been picking up no it would have never, never been any actual video it would have been just it would have been all of the data from the radars so if you stuck it into another system like a land-based version of the system to replay it you would just see tracks on a screen you would see environmental data if you were to uh, use it as, uh, I know that they use it, like they have a program that just basically pulls all the information and then turns it into uh, database sheets, you know, where they can sift through the information. And then the only other thing you're going to see is code. So there's no such thing as video of the radar picking these things up. The videos change the code when it's recorded. So it's, it's, it is there. It's just not not what you would see if you tried to like if i had the tape here today yeah and i tried to hook it into an optical drive into my computer uh-huh. it would come up as garbly gook unless i had all the programs that you were used to make them and to, you know if i had i'd have to have a simulation of the Aegis system at my house to actually and if you see. had that though then you could essentially replay what everybody saw yeah you could over and over and over just like you were there mm-hmm. um and that was what the crazy thing about CEC is is that it takes all of that data from our ship but it also takes that same data from every single ship in the battle group and makes a bigger picture and a more clear and defined picture and with the CEC data and that data you could make a very very clear on what exactly these objects did and how they moved so Fravor is unequivocal that nothing was taken from his group now, is that seem odd considering th- they took something from you and they took something from the bricks from the Nimitz that, that pertain to the Hawkeye? Well, it would seem odd that an officer, a flight officer, would even know about anything that was taken off of. I mean, none of our officers had anything to do with our recordings. I mean, my, my divo wouldn't even, unless my divo came down and was specifically asked to come down, my division officer. I don't even think I saw her the entire time. But Fravor is a squadron commander. Of the Black Aces only. Okay, but does that include Underwood? Uh, it could. I don't know if Underwood was in it. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that there's more than one squadron on a aircraft carrier. I see. But in order to get the, the video that we have, which is Underwood's video, that would have come off of what? Right off of his plane? Off of the... The it, would have, it, would have come, it would have come from the original video. And like I said, I think somebody had actually somewhere at some point compressed it to send it as an email to somebody. And then that got out. Thank you again to Gary Voorhees for appearing on the Hidden Truth Show. I want to share one thing that we looked into after our interview. So Captain Red Smith 
was the captain of the Princeton at the time of the incident. Voorhees reported that he later went on and, and received a large promotion. We looked into that and read Smith approximately five years after the incident. He was given the position of Foreign Affairs Specialist for Africa at U.S. Naval Forces Europe and Africa and commander of the Sixth Fleet. He still holds that position today. So Captain Red Smith, for the past 10 years, has been the commander of the Sixth Fleet in Africa. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Truth Show with Jim Breslow. You can find us at hiddentruthshow.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Truth Show. Join us again next week for another episode of Hidden Truth Show with Jim Breslow.